just waiting for the number of participants to increase down below. If you want to do share screen while, while we're waiting for the participants to be let in. Is this me you want to share screen? Yeah. Okay. You should, should be able to. Because, you know, I'll introduce you. Patrick's going to moderate the questions and then we'll um, we'll, we'll both go, go dark while you're talking. Okay. So, dang. Uh, what have I just done? No, you're good. You All right. The little but icon I, at the I, bottom. I, yeah. Hang on. I'm just sorry. I've just done something. I, it's you, you. You don't have a lot of control over what screen it decides to use. Ah. Here we go. Let me see. Let you do it. Okay, good. Perfect. 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 Fantastic. And let's see. It's three after. Hi, everyone. Uh, we'll get started in a minute or two, just waiting for a few more people to be led into the Zoom. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ken Mayer from the Harvard uh, Center for AIDS Research. And with my um, co-chair of this antiretroviral for prevention working group, Patrick Sullivan of the Emory CIFAR, we're delighted to welcome today uh, Dr. Deborah Donnell uh, to talk to us about novel des design um, issues for HIV prevention. Dr. Donnell is a professor of biostatistics, bioinformatics, and in, in the epidemiology program at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Center in the University of Washington. And she's also the principal investigator of the Statistical uh, Data Center for the HIV Prevention Trials Network. And as such, she spends a substantial amount of her time uh, thinking about these issues of trial design, uh, particularly for uh, prevention efficacy trials, particularly in the new age that we're in. So we're just delighted that you can spend the hour with us, Deborah. So please take it away. And well, um, people can put questions in the chat. Patrick will be moderating a Q and A at the end of uh, Deborah's talk. So thank you. And and again, we meet every um, other, every other month, uh, noon East Coast time, nine uh, p.m. Pacific, uh, the first uh, Monday of the month. So again, Deborah, thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. i get the dogs under control. Yes, you're perfect. So, <laughs> all right. So I was, um, I'm gonna to talk to you today about some um, uh, ideas we're considering a novel trial design for HIV prevention. And um, I'll start by talking about like, what is the situation and why are we in here? Um, many of you along with me have been through these, what I consider to be three different eras um, associated with HIV prevention successes, which have led to new challenges for future trial design. So up to about 2012, 2015, we were doing placebo randomized control trials because we didn't really have something that was very effective for preventing HIV. Then about between 2015, 2021, we had a proven oral ARV based prevention with FTC TDF. And during this era, we were doing two things. We were doing active control randomized trials. So discover HPT and weight three with, uh, with new prevention compared to Truvada. We were also at the same time doing placebo controlled trials with FTC as the standard of prevention. So that was how the AMP trials that were being done and how the mosaic and vaccine trials are done. Um, over the last couple of years, we now have these long acting ARB based prevention. And while they are not readily available, I think we're looking at, a uh, looking at a future where we have to consider these trials and what are we gonna do for, for new trials? So, so this is sort of a situation we're in. So I'm, I'm gonna take you briefly through a reminder of the design of these recently completed trials of new products. So up through what we're doing today, essentially. Um, what we have completed, what we are still doing. So generally, once you have an effective product, there are these three design choices, which basically depend on what you want to do with the new product. One is you want the product to replace the existing standard. So this is what I call a compare. So I'm going to do a trial where I compare an existing standard, oral Truvada, with a new product, um, Cavitaprobia, for instance. A second approach is that you want to 
get something like a vaccine or a monoclonal antibody, you want to prove that it works. You do a placebo randomized trial, but you allow everybody in the trial, and this is why I've got it in the background, to use Truvada. So you're, you're basically trying to see how effective this is on top of people's choice about whether they use Truvada. A third thing is that you actually have a product that you want to combine with an existing product. So you want people to use two prevention products together and you want to see what the benefit of that is. Um, there's not a lot of that in that HIV prevention space at the moment. But um, let's start with what we have been doing with the monoclonals and the vaccine trials. So for example, the, exa the design of the antibody mediated prevention studies was a superiority trial. And the primary objective was to determine whether and how well the RCO1, a broadly neutralizing monoclonal anti can antibody, could prevent HIV infection. So it was a three-arm trial with a placebo and two, a, a low and a high dose of BRCO1. And importantly, this arrow is pointing to what was in the standard of care. So in addition to condom, condoms and counseling about HIV prevention, part of the standard of care was that all participants in the trial were able to use Truvada. And then they were randomized in addition to that, depending on what they chose to do. Well, irrespective of what they chose to do. We, we tested whether the, the BRCO1 prevented um, infection relative to a placebo. So those AMP trials were completed in 2021. Uh, we did two separate studies, one in MSM and transgenders, transgender people, and another one in women. The trials were designed to have high power to detect a 60% versus a 0% reduction in risk of infection. And the sample sizes were in the two to three thousand dollar range, uh, depending on the essentially what the with a slightly lower zero incidence rate is a slightly larger trial. Um, all of the trial sites had a plan for access to Truvada in both studies, although the outcome of that was quite different depending on the depending on the study. So in the MSM transgender study done in the mostly in the Americas. 40% uh, of the person time in that study in both arms had detectable PrEP use. Um, and in fact, it was really more than 55, it was about 55% of the participants with the exception of Peru. However, in the women, a very different story, less than 5% of the person time had detectable PrEP. So the background use of Truvada was quite different in those trials. Um, something to keep in mind. So, so these, this is a kind of a synopsis, <laughs> a kind of ca capture of the trial results for MSM transgender trial on the left and the women's trial in the right. And as you can see, while there was a lower rate of infection in the placebo arm, the actual prevention efficacy overall um, in the trials was not very high. So um, it didn't meet our statistical significance, although there are obviously some as many of you will know, some very important findings about the sensitivity of the virus and the match between BRCO1 and the, the virus that people encountered. But um, these were those trial results with that design. Um, moving on now to what's going on in the antiretroviral field, uh, where we're actually designing trials that are supposed to be in, used um, instead of Truvada. And um, in these studies, we've done, again, two trials of a long-acting inject injectable versus a daily pill. So this is HPT in 083 and 084. Again, parallel to AMP, we did two separate studies, one in MSM and transgender women and one in women. These were active control trials. So we compared Truvada to a long-acting injectable. Um, the trial designs are double, du double blind and double dummy. So every participant in the trial was taking pills and receiving injections. In the MSM and transgender women, we did a non-inferiority trial design, which was supposed to have a high power to rule out a 23% increase. So the, the um, non-NI margin in that design was 1.23. In the women, we did a superiority trial because Truvada in a number of trials had not been um, effective in preventing HIV. So um, we didn't really have the, um, the margin to do a non-inferiority trial. So we did a superiority trial, which was powered to detect about a 50% reduction. So similar to the AMP trial, the sample sizes were slightly smaller in the women's trial and quite large in the MSM transgender trial. And these trial designs 
essentially assumed imperfect use of Truvada. So part of the trial designs was that we thought that adherence to Capoterra Rare would be higher, thus giving us a slightly um, higher effect size. So um, one of the issues about these trial designs is we do have these two different modalities. Um, so this is sort of repeating what I just said, actually, with the Capoterra Rare, because it was an injection, it had less effect on behavioral adherence in the Truvada with a daily pill and shorter active, while it was known to be highly effective, it's noted that it, there, there are adherence difficulties, especially in some of the women's studies. Um, the other thing to point out is that these as antiretrovirals, they are different, um, one's an INSTI and the other's an NNRTI. So they are, they do have different mechanisms of, uh, mechanisms of action, which might mean that they don't work the same as prevention modality. So, it was part of the challenge we were facing when we designed these trials. Again, a synopsis of the results. Um, both of these trials were finished early because we had much, much lower infection rates in the Capotega rare arm versus the Truvada arm. So we saw 13 infections in the CAB arm, 39 in, in the Truvada arm, yielding a very strong superiority result and a very small number of infections with very low infection rates. And similarly in the women, we saw 40 infections overall, four versus 36, which gave us this um, very high rate of um, prevention with a hazard ratio of 0 0.11. So this drug has been approved by the FDA um, in December, January, December. Um, and you know, I, I don't think it's readily available at the moment, um, though I shouldn't speak because I don't really know. Um, but this is the situation where I'm now looking into this, you know, this new era. So we have two trials which showed that cab -LA was more effective than tenofovir, than, than Truvada, my apologies. Um, CAB was more effective than Truvada in both MSM transgender women and more effective in women. And these um, e efficacies are, are very high. I mean, this is a 66% reduction if, um, compared to something which is already known to be very effective in MSM. And um, for cab -LA, this 89% reduction is clearly showing incredibly high efficacy in women. So um, what, we're, what I'm sort of here to talk to you today about is like, what, how is this gonna impact randomized clin clinical trials of new biomedical interventions? So um, while we, we have three recent successes, we have, a, you know, in addition to Truvada, we have FTAF, which is the same modality as Truvada, a daily oral pill, the dipiverine ring for women, while it's um, not been reviewed by the FDA, it is approved for use in, in settings in Africa. And then we have cab -LA, this long acting injectable. So we have a growing list of recent successes with different efficacies. Um, on the other hand, there are new agents um, being developed for prevention. There's a new oral PrEP pill, um, is Latravia. There's injectable um, PrEP being developed by Gilead, um, Lenacapavir. Um, people are working on implants. Um, there's a microbicide, um, a rectal microbicide under development. There are vaccines in the field and that field of monoclonal antibodies is also very active. So there are more things in the pipeline and we have to figure out how we're going to um, create the evidence to get new modalities that work approved and to make sure they truly do work. <clears throat> um, to me, the questions of vaccines and monoclonal antibodies at the moment are, are much more difficult than antiretrovirals. So I think um, the vaccine field is asking how, how are we going to do future vaccine trials when there are even more effective prevention drugs available? So at the moment, they're currently using what I call refer to as the layer approach. So they're placebo controlled trials, but with Truvada available to all. And in the future, you could think about, is this still going to be a good strategy with Cabotegravir available to all? So this approach is valid. It results in a larger trial. At the moment, it's resulting in slightly larger trials, but they're still planning to get the required number of endpoints to answer a straight placebo versus vaccine efficacy question. Um, with future monoclonal antibodies trials, um, you know, these are, these are the questions that we're discussing. When could you do a direct comparison to an ARB-based PrEP? So uh, would it be reasonable to expect a monoclonal antibody to be more efficacious or more effective than an ARB-based approach, or at least as effective? 
in a non-inferiority approach. And I think the other question when you're designing a non-inferiority trial, typically the monoclonal, the, the new product should have some kind of advantage in convenience or cost or effectiveness over the antiretroviral. And I think as I understand it from monoclonal antibodies, that's a pretty big ask that it be either more effective because I don't think it's likely to be more convenient or more cost effective or, or, or cheaper than an antiretroviral. So I think both of these are um, a set of really difficult questions about where we're gonna go with monoclonal antibodies. One thing I did wanna mention that's in the field at the moment is this, um, what I call the prevention mosaic approach for trials of new modes of, uh, modes of action. And when I say new modes of action, I'm talking about vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. So antiretrovirals have, you know, we have several antiretrovirals that have a proven mechanism of action. What a, a proven, yeah, well, I don't know what the mechanism is, but they have proven prevention um, effectiveness. With vaccines and monoclonal antibodies, um, the evidence is much weaker for high effectiveness. But um, the prevention mosaic is essentially this idea that amongst all people who need HIV prevention, different things work for different uh, groups of people. And provided there's still a group of people who aren't using any HIV prevention, we're still looking for a tool for them, which a vaccine or a monoclonal antibody could fulfill. And in that situation, there's a couple of approaches you could take in designing a trial. One is that you, offer to everybody in screening uh, a PrEP modality that they, they are willing to use. And you initiate that. And then after a run-in period, you, you evaluate whether or not they're being successful in using it. And if it isn't working for them, then you randomize them in to, to randomize to receive the new experimental product. Clearly, this experimental product has to work better for them than whatever it was that was offered. And during that trial, importantly, whatever, um, whatever it was that they tried before is still remains available to them. And if their PrEP was successful, they continue on that. Um, there's an opportunity, I think, for doing an observational part of a design if you were to do something like this, um, which has been explored, but not yet done, I don't think. Um, and this is this, a second sort of a modification of that approach is that you make PrEP readily available. So this could be you make Truvada readily available at the site. And when people come in and screen, you evaluate whether they're interested in that. If they are, you navigate them to PrEP. And if they are not, you do the same, randomizing them to the new modality that you're testing, again, leaving Truvada available for them to start anytime after randomization. So, so this is the approach that's been using in the current vaccine trial, HBTN 706. Uh, where they're trying, they're, they're doing an efficacy study of this vaccine amongst people who are, have expressed that they're not interested in PrEP. And I, I know this trial is enrolling successfully. I know um, that people who are not interested in taking Truvada are um, being evaluated in this, in this trial, uh, uh, um, in the placebo randomized trial of this vaccine. Um, again, looking at this strategy going forward, um, I think we have to evaluate what types of products could use, continue to use this approach. So you're basically evaluating it in a subpopulation of those at risk who are not able, willing, interested, or successful in using all the tools that are currently available and effective. So I think for um, where we are today in the current trial, we do have quite a bit of knowledge that not that there are many who are not very successful with taking daily oral PrEP. I think if we look ahead at the strategy for a PrEP injectable for something like cabotegravir or lenacapavir maybe in the future, um, we actually are in a situation where we don't yet know whether there's a substantial number of at risk who won't use injectable or oral PrEP. Um, so there's a sort of a question mark around that. I, I think this, the second thing is um, whatever it is you're testing has to overcome whatever barriers people have to taking a pill a day or taking a regular injection. And I think both vaccines and monoclonal antibodies have some sim similarities to uh, taking an injectable. So um, I, I think I, I certainly personally, I have some doubt about whether we'll be able to continue using this strategy in the future. Um, I think the other thing you have to worry a little bit about is if you are doing the trial in a relatively specialized population. You do have to worry about what um, that will mean for approval of the drug. Uh, 
if it's not done in a general population setting. Um, so now I'm going to turn more to the world that I live in a bit more, which is trial designs for new products with similar modes of action. So I'm basically talking here about different small molecule ARV based products. So the questions for new antiretrovirals for prevention is how are we going to do these trials with lenacapavir and monthly pills and implants? Sorry, I went backwards. Um, so here I'm showing you a little bit the challenge that this is just like with current data, the challenges we have. And it really is in this column here. So I'm showing you the three non-inferiority trials that were done and the, and the AMP trials that were placebo controlled. And what you can see here is in the experimental product arms, we are seeing HIV incidence rates that are below a half a percent, low 0.5 per hundred person years. And this, um, so, you know, in 083, we saw 13 events. In 084, we saw four events in the randomized trial. So when I think about trying to design active controlled trials in the future, this is becoming a challenge. We're essentially going to see a decreasing number of infection events, and that means larger trials. So just for example, this trial here is exactly the conditions that we used for um, designing 083, and it was a doable trial. We, we enrolled 4,500 people. We were planning to get nearly 10,000 person years. And this was in a situation where incidence was about 2.1%. I've just shown you the actual in incidence on cabotegravir on the, if that became the standard is less than a half a percent, you know, in a future where we um, only have a, an HIV incidence of 1% and we have a product that we think is actually going to be slightly more effective than cabotegravir, we're now talking about enrolling 10,000 people. In the more realistic non-inferiority trial, maybe we could imagine a situation with a future incidence on the standard of 1%. With a, with a product that we think is not going to be more effective, but similarly effective, suddenly we're talking about trials of 40,000 people. And this, I think, is a situation where we're like, oh, I don't think we can really do these trials. It's going to be obviously really high risk to, to conduct a classical randomized clinical trial of the incidence rates are below 1%. Um, we expect rates this low when participants have access to highly effective long-acting prevention. We are at risk because we might not gather enough evidence as in HIV infections to prove effectiveness. Not only are those very large sample size going to be really costly, but once you get up to enrollments of 40,000 people, I think it's I think we're going to be then expanding enrollment into lower risk populations. So, so then it becomes kind of like you're fighting against yourself to enroll a huge population, but not necessarily get more HIV infections. So what we're looking at is what, are, you know, what we're thinking about is what other approaches can we use. So essentially, I'm going to talk through some of the thinking about estimating um, counterfactual approaches, counterfactual placebo approaches, which is essentially to estimate what the infection rate would have been if there had been a placebo. So if you take HBT083, we had a Cabalet arm and a Truvada arm. And essentially, what we're looking at is approaches where we could try and estimate what the placebo rate would have been in that trial. So. I'm going to start looking at approaches for estimating efficacy relative to a counterfactual. I'm going to start with some kind of like background thinking about where this is coming from. So um, I'm going to go through three of these possible approaches that are under investigation. So one is trying to do counterfactual bridging from contemporary placebo data. So I, I'll talk about a registrational cohort approach or using placebo data from external trials. There's an idea under development, well, there's an idea being used actually of cross-sectional incidence, um, estimating this during screening. The idea of bridging using the efficacy adherence relationship and a couple of other ideas about using predictors of HIV exposure or um, immune markers. Um, but I, I wanna sort of start with some thinking about the, um, the, 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 the strategy and how it fits in. And I, let's, I wanted to put to you that the, if we consider the non-inferiority trial design as a kind of a gold standard for this situation where, we, where you have a known effective intervention. So why is a non, you know, how, is, how does a non-inferiority trial, how is it developed as a gold standard? So it is a randomized trial. You have this internal 
validity of an experimental versus an established standard, which, and the established standard is known effective and it's used as an active control. You use a non-inferiority margin to define the success criteria for effectiveness for your randomized active versus experimental. And I think one of the things that I just want to be really clear about is that non-inferiority trial is based on a prior placebo-controlled randomized clinical trial. So it's, it's the NI margin is based on data from an external trial. You never in a non-inferiority trial get an efficacy estimate relative to placebo only to the standard. But this idea, in a certain sense, I, I feel as if the non-inferiority trial has already put in place this idea that you use external data to create a standard for, um, for a new product without actually using a placebo. So some of the principles that are, I think probably took a long time to develop, I don't know, it's a little bit before my era, but some of the accepted principles for this non-inferiority trial comparison is first this principle of con constancy, so that when you develop the standard from a prior randomized clinical trial to this current trial, that non-inferiority margin should account for bias or lack of reliability in the estimate of the effect of the standard. The second principle is this effect preservation, so that the non-inferiority trial should achieve preservation of a percentage of the effect of the standard. And I think that's really this idea that if something is 50% effective, then whatever else you're developing at least needs to be close to that in effectiveness. And that's defined by the um, NI margin and this concept of effect preservation. So one more sort of the details of how these are actually implemented in non-inferiority trials, because I think some of these ideas are very helpful. This constancy idea, this um, accounting for the bias or lack of reliability, how is this actually implemented? So the two ideas behind here is that the non-inferiority trial is not ever done under the same conditions as the prior trial. So there needs to be some allowance, some conservativeness about taking the effect from a prior trial into the new trial. Also, the effect in the prior trial, the effect of the standard is measured, it's, it has uncertainty, it has a confidence interval about it. And so the way this is implemented in a, in a non-inferiority trial is that you use a really conservative estimate of the relative effect from the placebo-controlled trial when you take it forward as a standard. And then the second principle about this preservation of effect, the non-inferiority margin should pres uh, achieve preservation of a percentage of the effect of the standard. And that's interpreted as the experimental arm must not be unacceptably worse than the standard in the new trial. I'm sure you've all heard this language. So the way that's implemented is the non-inferiority trial that basically defines the, the line in the sand that's considered to be an unacceptable difference. And in order for you to beat that unacceptable difference, the 95% competence interval from the non-inferiority trial has to, um, not, has to beat that margin. So um, for an example, there are, there are different ways of setting up non-inferiority trials. One common approach is this, what's called 95-95 approach. And what you actually do is you use the lower bound of the 95% competence interval from the prior randomized clinical trial as, as a conservative measure of the established effect. And then you set the non-inferiority margin to 50% of that. <clears throat> and the non-inferiority trial established the experimental is non-inferior to the standard when the 95% competence interval from that trial excludes the NI margin, right? But when you really stand back and think about what's going on here, you're taking evidence from a prior trial, right? You're taking evidence from a prior controlled trial. You're encapsulating that as a competence interval of the prevention efficacy and using that to define a non-inferiority margin for the prior trial. And then provided this, this sorry, the non-inferiority margin for the future trial, and provided that margin is excluded by this prevention efficacy, you're calling this an effective trial. So I, um, I've, you, th there's a lot of art in this, and um, I've, I sort of feel as if the, it's the uh, principles behind what, how a non-inferiority trial um, are, are set out are, are a very useful thing to carry into the era of counterfactual placebos. So I'm sorry if that's really technical in a, in a way, but the ideas here, I think, are going to be helpful to us as we start developing um, counterfactual placebo approaches for, for regulatory use. So I'm assuming 
in this future trial experimental context, I'm assuming the following things, that we will continue to do a randomized trial with an experimental and an active control arm. So we're gonna retain that internal validity of a direct causal comparison in a future trial. That the counterfactual placebo measures that we're using come from the context of a prior or current randomized clinical trial, because then you get high quality ascertainment of the incidence or effect without a product. And we have high quality measurement of the people that placebo data comes from. So again, you can see how I'm sort of drawing on the way in non-inferiority trials work now in this new counterfactual placebo. The trial goal with the counterfactual placebo is to establish that experiment and active, experimental and active control groups have similar infection rates and the experimental and active control groups have lower infection rates than the placebo. So if the experimental is works, it should be somewhat similar to what we already know works and it should be far away from the placebo rate. That's basically the principle here. Again, a placebo, is a substance with no therapeutic effect made identical in appearance to an experimental biologic used as a control in testing new drugs. So I, the way I'm trying to set up this framework is our goal is to estimate the effect of an experimental biological relative to a placebo if counted to fact that trial had a randomized placebo arm. And I think I, the way, things I keep in mind are the characteristics of the gold standard placebo control design is within each group or arm, we have this expected balance with respect to measured and unmeasured confounders. We have the same follow-up time distribution in each site, in each arm, and we have the same consistent background exposure risk. So when I'm going forward with a counterfactual placebo, I can't achieve any of these, but I can look very closely at in what ways am I not close to this that I have to worry about in, um, in the same idea, you know, carrying forward this, like, what are my constancy assumptions and what am I going to set up as my criteria for success for this placebo, for this placebo counterfactual? So, um, coming, so, um, so in, in a way, just taking the diagram that I had before, the sort of conceptual diagram and non-inferiority trial, what we're going to be doing in the, the things I'm going to talk about from this point on is rather than using, um, this carrying forward the effect of the placebo directly to a non-inferiority margin, I'm going to be um, talking about other ways that we can measure HIV uh, incidence in a placebo type setting that we're planning to use as a comparator for the active control and the experimental control. So these counterfactual placebo estimates instead of a non-inferiority margin. So let's look at some specific approaches. Um, here is an approach that's been used in the PrepVac trial. So this trial um, is being, I think it's in, the, in some stage of the field at the moment. And what they have done, they're doing a phase three, three arm um, trial with a vaccine part and a PrEP part. So they're testing two different vaccines versus a placebo. And at the same time, they're, they're, they have a PrEP, um, they're using PrEP for, they're comparing Truvada versus Discovi. But in the time period between when they decided to the trial and got funding to the trial and they actually start the formal randomization, they ran this prep vet registration cohort where they screened people and followed people um, in the, before they started um, giving people study products. And their plan is to use the incidence rate that they observed in this registrational cohort as a comparator for the prep parts of the trial. So, um, some of the statistical considerations for follow-up from prior follow-up, sorry, this is, I can't see my title, but some of the statistical considerations for this aspect is that, so it does meet some of the standards that I talked about. The placebo rates are based on observed longitudinal incidence rate in a registration cohort or a prior placebo. So it has the strength that the same people are going from the registrational cohort into the trial. So there's crossover of some participants. So you're gonna get a population with similar characteristics. There's very, you know, because it's all within the trial, you get consistent measurement of the covariates. And the, the follow-up on of HIV rates is closely contemporary and it's at exactly the same sites. So some of the aspects of a randomized clinical trial are being preserved here. Some of the challenges, well, 
HIV exposure could change. Um, every person in the trial is older when they get into the randomized portion than they were when they were in the registrational cohort. There's going to be some dropout. There's going to be, and, and anyone, of course, who gets HIV infected is, is censored in the new trial. Um, I think some special considerations for the registrational cohort is um, as time goes on, there will be probably be increasing PrEP use during the registrational cohort follow-up. So then it ceases to be a true placebo, but it more like a standard of care with what, however people chose to use PrEP. I, I haven't seen sample size calculations for this. So the number enrolled and, and the amount of follow-up in the registrational cohort appears to be somewhat coincidental. So it's dependent on the time to begin the randomized trial, and I don't know how much that could be controlled. Um, the analysis framework for this is planned to use the averted infection ratio framework, um, which has been well developed by Dave Glidden and David Dunn. Um, so I think they have a very nice statistical framework for this. And clearly an assumption of this approach is that it assumes a constant HIV exposure risk conditional on the included covariates. So when I look at this you know, protection of effectiveness, going back to the ideas that came from the non-inferiority trial, the constancy assumption in this setting is essentially whether the counterfactual placebo incidence remains representative of the untreated HIV risk during the study follow-up. Given that it's in the same setting and the same population and closely contemporaneous, that doesn't seem like a terrible assumption, but it is an assumption nonetheless. And I don't think I've seen um, an explicit um, uh, accommodation of that, making that assumption. I can tell you too that the criterion for success has been well worked out and in the in this setting with the averted infection ratio, it's basically based on similar ideas as the non-inferiority framework. Um, the second idea of this um, is of using a counterfactual placebo is bridging using placebo from an external trial. And I'm show, going to show you a couple of examples that I've certainly been involved in. One is um, in the discordant couple setting, we did a bridging of the infection rate from a controlled clinical trial into a, um, into a demo project. And in both HPT and 083 and AMP, uh, where we had the setting of parallel placebo randomized trials and active control trials, I have um, I presented at CROI some of the um, some of the work that I was doing on trying to bridge from one placebo from one trial to the next. And I did want to point out to you that the EMPOWER trial, um, to the best of, I mean, I'm not involved in this trial, but they are planning on analysis against a sentinel cohort. So there is based on, in the, within this randomized clinical trial of Isla Trivia, they are planning um, an analysis that uses a background incidence rate from a sentinel cohort. But just to look at what I did for 083 and the AMP women, so 084 and the AMP women's trial. So here I'm showing you what I mean by, <clears throat> here we were doing this 084 was an active control trial. Each of these other trials had um, um, uh, women being followed in a randomized clinical trial with HIV incidence being measured and no active um, product being used for HIV prevention. So I constructed for each of these trials <clears throat> uh, using um, incidence rates with overlap, overlapping sites. I constructed what the CAB LA incidence was from 084 and, and what the counterfactual placebo incidence was from each of these trials for the given sites that overlapped it and um, found a very nicely consistent efficacy estimate based on comparison with a placebo counterfactual from an external trial. So we're kind of working on the frameworks here. The statistical considerations, the strengths is, th these are trials that actually do come from, we're using a true placebo. So this matching inert product in an RCT. The placebo rates again from high quality RCTs. They're cl closely contemporaneous to somewhat more distant follow-up. Um, we had partial site and regional overlaps, so a very similar settings. And they had very well characterized populations with, with very similar eligibility. I think some of the challenges, the estimates do assume this constant HIV incidence rate. Um, and it, it, you know, like that direct bridging using incidence rate, I think becomes much more tenuous if we're thinking about using this in the future. It's one thing for me to do a comparison when the, the trials are done more or less the same era, but five years from now, I don't know that you could use this data um, from, from these placebo rates. Um, I have worked some time with some math modelers and this idea that maybe math modeling would be a tool we could explore sensitivity to changing HIV epidemic conditions. Um, 
And again, um, this placebo from these trials, uh, particularly from the AMP trials, is, as I sort of suggested, it's in this context of substantial PrEP access. So um, then again, you know, you, you run into this problem about when, when I talk about placebo, do I mean with or without PrEP use? And I think, you know, like th that's a difficult issue to, to navigate when there's a fair amount of PrEP use. Um, I know certainly when I did my first analysis of this, the answer I got back from um, my investigator was like, that's not the effect we're interested in. So I think, you know, coming up with a true placebo is um, going to be challenging in some settings. I can also say that between AMP and H the HPDN trials, the covariate measurements were not necessarily consistent, which made things a little bit difficult. Um, coming to this constancy, I think, as I said, you know, um, it is the same setting in the same population, closely contemporaneous, so that will work for some settings. Um, when it comes to if preserving effect, I think what we've been working on is that the fact that the competence interval, while the competence interval that I build appropriately incorporates measurement uncertainty, I think there is a requirement that for success where possibly we have to set the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval to establish substantial effect relative to counterfactual placebo. This is sort of something we're working on. Um, by the looks of it, time, I think I'm only going to have time to go through the cross-sectional incidence assessed during screening and enrollment, and I'm just going to briefly, I don't want to take up all the time. So let me just quickly go through this cross-sectional incidence approach. Um, I wanted to point out this, just, just so you know, this, this cross-sectional HIV incidence has been incorporated in two trials that are currently in the field, designed and in the field, have gone through FDA re review. So both Lena Kapavir and Isla Trivia are planning on a counterfactual, a, a randomized clinical trial with the primary endpoint being the in infection rate in Lena Kapavir versus this background HIV based on cross-sectional incidence. So these ideas are already in place. So the study design using cross-sectional recency assay, and I'm showing um, Faye and Jim have both worked on some of the statistics behind a, a lot of this, but this is basically the way these trials run. You screen people. Anyone who's HIV positive is, uh, gets applied to a recency assay. That recency assay has a known characteristic of its mean duration that, that people remain recently infected, their infections look recent. Based on that, um, and using this calculation down here, you can cut you you is, sorry you estimate the number of people who are recent in the screen positive population. Amongst those who screen negative, you randomize them as normal to an active control versus experimental. So this is the trial, and then um, based on this, you end up with a counterfactual incidence, an active arm incidence, and experimental arm incidence. So some things to keep in mind here: the screening needs to have the screened population for this to work, the screen population that you're taking in here needs to have HIV risk that's representative of the enrolled population. So you need to be careful that you're not screening out HIV infected people. <clears throat> and I, I think um, the second thing about the screening population is if you're screening in a situation where there is a lot of Truvada use, you have the same issue that many of your screen population are already using Truvada and they're not really at quote unquote placebo risk. They're at a standard risk within the with the with the, the sort of standard of care risk. So in this statistical framework, the strengths of this is again, you have this crossover from the um, counterfactual screening into the trial of the majority of the participants because all of the HIV negative people uh, uh, contribute to both the counterfactual the to both the recency incidence estimate and the future trial estimate. You have partially overlapping time in exactly the same sites because the screening process of course goes on while there's follow-up going on in the trial. I think there is the potential to continue or expand the screening to increase the precision of the recency. So we normally screen people until we get to a fixed, a fixed amount. It would be possible, though I don't know that many people like this idea, to continue screening throughout the entire conduct of the trial in order to increase the precision of this recency estimate. The sample sizes of this approach, which have been worked out, they seem to be pretty reasonable. Some of the challenges. Um, it, you see, it's using two different measures of HIV incidence. While they're both well characterized, they are different. Um, I've mentioned already the screening has to be represented with the future enrolled population. 
the screening includes PrEP users, those are both problems. And I, I'd say personally, that we don't have a lot of field experience with identifying recent infection in, in screening. So um, the protection, constancy assumption, we have the same sites, we have close concurrency, the success criteria. I think most of the time when I've worked on these designs with people, there is a proposal of a hypothesis with super superiority so that the 95% confidence interval against the placebo has to rule out a placebo-based incidence of at least 50% um, increase. So, you know, I think you can put guys, but I haven't seen exactly what the success criteria are that people are using. Um, they've been very well worked out by some of statisticians. They've really worked out the exact assumptions of these comparisons. So there is a nice statistical framework for this. I think um, something that I haven't seen worked out really well, and our, my group is working this, is what exactly is the definition of a, a success? You now have three arms, um, the counterfactual placebo, the active arm, the experimental arm. I think in the Lena Capovere trial, they're just doing the experimental arm versus the placebo counterfactual, but it seems clear that there needs to be some kind of criteria about this active arm and the placebo or the experimental arm. So you know, here are some ways you could set it up. But I think the statistical framework for this three arm comparison is not terribly well worked out. So um, I'm not probably gonna go through these, these uh, last three. Um, I will comment that the, this number five, this immune markers um, for monoclonal and vaccines, I don't um, think we actually, before these immune markers can be developed, we actually have to have highly effective um, products. And I think, so I think these are not quite ready for time, but you know, they will be ready in the future. Um, that's work, that's future work. The placebo risk using um, reliable count, uh, predictors of HIV risk. Again, I think the statistical framework of this is being worked on. Um, again, I just don't know that we have at the moment today a reliable predictor of HIV exposure risk. Um, <clears throat> and I just don't have time to do this adherence if it, if it does new relationship. Um, so the, the counterfactual placebo strategy, um, just, I'm sort of, I'll just do a little summary here. Um, the two arm RCT, so, so the, the goal, the, the plan is that we still do a two arm randomized clinical trial with an experimental and a standard used as an active control, and we plan a placebo counterfactual. This approach is going to require a framework for three arms, incorporating both uncertainty of the measurements we're taking forward and uh, some kind of defined success criteria for what it is that we think proves that the experimental is, is um, effective for prevention. I think it's more likely they're going to be appropriate for a new agent that is expected to be highly effective. And I'm saying that just because of this distance, I, th I think you're going to need a substantial distance between your placebo counterfactual and the rate you're, of infection you're seeing on the experimental arm. These um, counterfactual placebos do seem to be feasible in terms of sample size. I, most of the work that I've done too, I think the, these counterfactual approaches are likely to be combined with other approaches to estimate counterfactual placebo incidence. So I think people are feeling like you, you'll need probably uh, several eggs in your basket. So just to summarize, um, trials of these novel ARVs are proceeding and they're proceeding with these counterfactual placebo assessments planned. They all currently include a randomization to an active standard arm. And the comparison of both the standard and the experimental with the counterfactual placebo are available. I'd say in my view at the moment, the assessment with the counterfactual placebo appears to be primary for efficacy, for establishing efficacy. Um, I think the statistical frameworks to better understand the assumptions and the study performance are, in my opinion, slightly underdeveloped at the moment. And it's not clear to me at least, if standards to actually establish effectiveness have been set, or if they have been set, how they're appropriately account incorporating uncertainty. I um, also want you to know and see that data from completed trials are available for testing different potential approach analysis approaches to this bridging and attention to appropriately protect against uncertainty of these constancy type assumptions and understand the veracity of the effect. These, these studies are definitely needed. So I'm going to end there. Great. Thank you, Deborah. And um, that sound you hear is uh, uh, many muted hands clapping. <laughs> that noise from the meeting that I'm at at Hopkins. So um, thank you so much for, uh, for tackling a complicated, uh, a, a complicated problem, even for folks like you who think about it, uh, but really um, putting it in terms that 
um, that we can identify the issues. And I think we have a couple questions that get at some of those issues. But before we do that, I just I want to say in my glass half full, um, you know, mode that uh, had I, I just think when I um, had um, the the pleasure of working for a short time at the Vaccine Trials Network, we if we'd known that we would be at a time when we had so you know such effective medications that we'd have this problem, I mean, in a way, it's a good problem to have. Um, and I, to have people like you and and colleagues working on it. So. Um, I'm going to jump into a couple questions here. Um, one is um, whether there's concern about a Hawthorne effect in a run-in observational cohort that the the incidents in the in the period that you observe in the run-in might be different than um, I mean I think you sort of acknowledge they're going to be just definitionally older and there's some secular trend, but also um, the the process of observation might change. So it, is that a concern? And if so, would there be a thought to look at a sensitivity analysis for that, or is it just sort of baked into that method? No, I, I, I think there is, a, I mean, anytime you're doing a placebo at a different time than actually randomized in your clinical trial, you know, things can go wrong. And in a, in a sense, that's why I kept bringing up this, this issue about you're making an assumption of constancy. You're, you're assuming that the HIV incidence rate you're seeing in this, whatever you're using for placebo, whether it be a, you know, a prior registrational cohort or a prior trial, you're making the assumption that that is applicable to your new situation. And I think we have to be careful. Um, much like in a non-inferiority trial, we're making an assumption that the effectiveness we saw in the previous trials applies to the current trial for the standard. And um, so I, I think we have to put in place some kind of guard against that, that constancy assumption and you know, some way in which we're being conservative in carrying that effect forward. Um, exactly it, you know, how to do that is, is more of an art than a science. Um, I, I, I do think um, if, the, if the question was specifically about Hawthorne, I, I do think that um, you, you'll notice in my thinking about this is I, I do think HIV incidents should be, the, the placebo incident should come from a controlled trial, should come from some, like a high quality cohort follow-up or something. And then I think my thinking is that that Hawthorne effect of like things being affected because they're being measured would be the same in the clinical trial as it was in the in the long term follow up because everybody's being followed in a consistent manner with a similar standard of care so I do think you can alleviate the Hawthorne part of it a little bit by having very similar characteristics in which you're capturing the HIV incidence data. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question, which is, do you foresee a time where we would accept local detailed surveillance data as a counterfactual incidence estimate. And um, Colleen Kelly mentions, you know, in, in uh, trial designs like Mosaico and Gilead Len are just gonna be really hard to, um, to implement uh, in, in real life. So would there be any, um, would there be any situation you, do you think, and I, I think part of this obviously has to do with FDA as well, but um, where sort of, uh, just detailed counterfactual incidents at, uh, estimates that that were contemporary. I, I, I guess one is is contemporary incidence estimates, and the other might be um, any kind of you know public health data. Is there consideration for that? Mm -hmm. um, I I, th I think in a way I'd throw the challenge a little bit back at at the question. Is kind of like do you, do you think you'd be able to character to set I mean it's like if you were in the position of presenting this idea to the FDA you'd have to justify that this was a reasonable comparison to make and I think some of the challenges with surveillance data is is the lack of detail that you have about the cohort that you're characterizing so in, in my use you know in my um, work with surveillance that you know there's very few things that are ca captured about people um, in the surveillance system Whereas in the randomized clinical trial, you're almost always trying to work in a population which has met a fairly stringent set of eligibility criteria. So there may be settings in Africa where you're, you're, you know, you're, pop, you're, you're enrolling a general um, uh, from the general population with very few eligibility criteria, in which case it might be more reasonable. Um, to use a surveillance that 
you can claim has a similar set of character, a very closely similar population of people you're following. But I think in our um, trials of MSM, you know, in the in the US, they've generally been pretty high risk populations. And I think it's very difficult to define that same set of high risk from surveillance sets. But um, I think it's something we should keep in mind. If we want to do that, we may have to pay attention to being able to characterize a similarly uh, a, a group with similar risk characteristics. Because in a certain sense, what would happen is you might end up working against yourself because you do a surveillance, but it's in a much lower risk group, and then you have similar HIV incidents in the lower risk group as you do in your high risk cohort with protection. So you know, I, I do think you have to be careful. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think we worry so much about um, about falsely claiming a fact that, but but missing a true effect would be just as tragic. All right. Well, we are we are at time. Um, although uh, there's lots of good discussion to be had here, so I will just on behalf of um, my my co-chair Ken Mayer just thank you again for um, for just giving us such a fantastic. Uh, I, re I really feel like I, I know something about this, which is better than where I came in. So that's a feat um, on, that's only attributable to your good presentation. And I'll um, remind uh, everybody on the call, in including you, Deborah, you're welcome to come, that on June um, 6th, um, Shaheen uh, Lachman will be uh, presenting, and we will be circulating a topic and links for that closer to the event. But for now, thanks to all of you for attending, especially thanks to you, Deborah and Ken. Do you have a last word? No, I think this was really, really an excellent talk. And what I'm sure we will ask you back, Deborah, to revisit because certainly the, the challenges of the study design are not going to go away as we iterate new uh, products and concepts. They might multiply. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank thanks, you. everybody, and have a great afternoon or morning. Take care. Good.